good evening. If it's evening for you or morning or uh, lunchtime, perhaps. Uh, my name is Michael Moore. I am the past president of the World Federation of Public Health Associations, and I'm chair of the Immunisation Task Force of the World Federation of Public Health Associations. Before I begin, I'd like to acknowledge our sponsors, uh, the University of Geneva, Geneva uh, Pfizer, and our uh, World Federation Task Force on Immunisation. I'd also like to acknowledge that the statement I'm about to make is prepared largely with the help of George, Dr. George Amofa from Ghana. Various measures are being implemented to reduce the risk of exposure, to minimise the risk of infection as part of our responses to COVID-19. These include social distancing, face masks, hand washing, sanitizers, tracking, testing, isolation and treatment. The key problem with most of these interventions is they have to be initiated repetitively and almost forever, well, as long as the pandemic continues. Not surprisingly, the race to produce an efficacious and cost-effective vaccine for COVID-19 has been ongoing. And there are indications that we may have smiles on our faces regarding this before too long. This optimism is born by the fact that effective vaccines have been absolute game changers when humanity has faced similar challenges, such with measles, with polio and yellow fever. Unfortunately, experiences from previous immunisation programs have shown that even when effective vaccines are available, vulnerable persons, particularly in low income settings, usually do not have access to these vaccines. And there are a myriad of reasons for this state of affairs. High cost of vaccination programs uh, to individuals, family, health systems, country as a whole, poor geographical access to vaccination centres, inadequate supply of uh, vaccines due to competition, amongst others. And these are some of the issues that we'll be talking about today. And today we have an eminent group of speakers. Uh, originally, we had um, Dr. Carla Dominguez coming and she's not able uh, to make it because she's unwell. Uh, but from Brazil, we're very fortunate uh, that Professor Luis Eugenio uh, de Souza is, uh, is going to be able to uh, join us. So our first speaker is Dr. Eva Caborguera, uh, an immunization specialist and team leader from UNICEF. Uh, then we have uh, Dr. Russell Bakarov, uh, the, the WHO representative from Samoa, American Samoa, Cook Islands, Nui and Tukala. They will be followed by Professor D'Souza. And then in conclusion, we have Dr. Volta Ricciardi, who is the current president of the World Federation of Public Health Associations. Allow me to introduce our, our first speaker. Our first speaker, Dr. Eva Kabungera Akiki. She's an immunization specialist, team leader with UNICEF in Uganda. She has a master's in international medicine and a, and a diploma in tropical medicine and public health and has under undertaken various postgraduate training courses. And these include health policy and financing at the London School of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. Over 20 years of work experience in the area of public health, she's focused on immunization, including polio eradication efforts. Since 2000, Dr. Eva has worked with UNICEF Uganda as an immunization specialist. She provided oversight, technical assistance, and she's ably contributed to, immunize, to ensuring immunization coverage in Uganda. Prior to joining UNICEF, Dr. Eva served in the Ministry of Health Uganda, leading to uh, polio uh, uh, national immunization days and the Uganda National Expanded Program for Immunization uh, in UNIPI. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Eva Kabongara Akiki. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Murray, and thank you for the opportunity to make this presentation. I'm going to present about the what makes immunization successful, and I will use Uganda as I will present the facts from Uganda. Uh, my presentation is going to look mainly at the, the key things that I think contribute to the good immunization program, and these include vaccine and logistics, advocacy and communication, service delivery where we need to plan to reach every child, 
uh, including the equity considerations, the urban immunization that is becoming an issue, using of the private sector, monitoring and surveillance is also very key. And then I end up with elimination in the context of COVID. Resource mobilization and availability of funding is also a key issue. Supplementary immunization campaigns have also contributed to a successful immunization program. Uganda is in, found in East Africa and it has a population of more than 40 million children. I mean, million population, a gross rate of 3%. And Uganda is one of the countries with the highest facility rate, more than five births per, per woman. And yeah, it is divided in 235 districts and one capital city, though other capital cities are coming up. Uh, the, the, this slide just shows the immunization program, how it has been faring, the, the performance. Uh, we, we have more than 13 antigens that are given. But the slide shows that we, Uganda was, has been able to achieve at least the 80% mark for almost all the antigens, apart from some dips here and there. But the, the main problem is moving from 80 to 100%. It is something that always has a big, lot of issues. And here we also have the, 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 the introduction of the new vaccines that has been coming on, starting in 2002 when we introduced the pentavalent vaccine then 2014 PCV, um, IPV 2016, rotavirus 2018, and most recently we had MR that was introduced in the routine immunization program. Uh, the emergence of hesitancy is, is something that is coming up. And as I said, when you reach that level of 80% going on or upwards, always has a lot, a lot of issues. I'll start with the, the vaccine management and logistics, which is very key to a successful immunization program. Uganda has a, a very well established central vaccine store, which is integrated with other medical supplies at national medical stores. According to the assessment by various teams in, in African region and, and even globally, it has been said to be the state of the art uh, uh, medical stores that, that manages vaccines and, and is doing very, very, very well. And in every district, at least one thing that Uganda is proud of, we have uh, the, the established district vaccine stores in almost all 135 districts. There are a few new ones that the, the system is not so well established, but at least in all the districts, we have a district vaccine, vaccine store. And then below the districts, we have the health facilities, which, are, which we call static facilities that have the equipment, the cold chain equipment to store vaccines. And these are more than 3,700. And, and these are well equipped. And, and the Gavi support that has come on has even improved the, stero the storage capacity much, much more. And the, the, this is very well established in all the, the districts. Human resource, of course, is very key to the, to the immunization program. And, and with this related to vaccine management, we have the district at national level, we have the, the, the people who manage the vaccine at national level. At the district level, we have the district cold chain assistants. And then at the health facility level, we have the frontline health workers who also well manage the, the vaccine. Distribution of vaccines from national level, from global, from Copenhagen to UNICEF, I mean to a national level, is every quarter the vaccines are brought in. And government of Uganda has been procuring most of the traditional vaccines and, and the co-financing is so well done. So vaccine availability at national level is something that is well managed. And every month, National Medical Service distributes vaccines to the, to the districts. So it is very rare that we have stock out of vaccines at national level and even at the district vaccine stores. The problem sometimes is at the health facility level because of the last mile delivery, which is not so well established. So, so there, there is, there is a, an issue. We have a lot of tools that help in the stock management. Of course, there are some issues with follow-up and making sure that everyone reports, but at least the system 
is there and well established. Uh, this slide just shows the, how the effective vaccine management assessments have been done over years from 2011 2018 and, and you can see the great improvement at the national level the national level that's why the last assessment that was done in 2018 it was reported as the state of the art vaccine management and, and it is something that many people many countries have come to learn and, and to know how the, the vaccines are well managed in Uganda so at national level it is quite very well done the, the district level, they, they, it is also much improving, much better. The, the problem is at the health facility level, the service delivery level, there are some issues, but these are also being addressed. So every time we do a vaccine management assessment, there is an implementation plan that is done to address some of the issues that, that have been, the gaps that have been identified. So there is a lot of improvement, but it's key to have a functioning, vaccine management cold chain system to an effective immunization system. The next is the community mobilization. Community mobilization advocacy is key. And, and you know, if you have the demand side well catered for, without, I mean the supply side well catered for, you have to have the demand side also very well done. So, in Uganda, one of the advantages that we have is at the highest level, it is immunization is a priority. So it is given the, the highest support that it, it actually requires. The president cannot talk for more than five minutes without mentioning immunization in almost every speech that he does. And he thinks it's very successful and he wants to maintain it successful. So there is always, we, we, the immunization program at least has that advantage. Uh, commitment to co-financing, Uganda, at least we have been making sure that all the co-financing is paid. So there is nothing that, there's no defaulting, there's no anything. So that is the commitment at, at, at that level. Information dissemination through written and, and media platforms, communication and mobilizing the, the communities. No immunization to be successful, the, the communities have to be aware and we know that the dynamic population of the, of the, of the target population, because for them, my mother, more I'm a grandmother, and, and the other day I'm, I'm completely off, and there's another cohort that is coming on. So that's the need of making sure that the information dissemination is cons constant, so that we, we have the, the population aware, and they understand the value of, of immunization. So there are a lot of school programs also to make sure that the immunization should be stored right from the primary school, to make sure that people grow up with it, knowing that they have to immunize their children when they actually get, get them. The other mobilization is the, at the, the urban and the unreached populations and special groups. There's a lot of effort that is put in to make sure that all the populations are, are actually reached, going through their leaders, going through every effort that there is to make sure that the information actually reaches, reaches out. Uh, village health teams, we have the village health teams that have been established. Every village has a, a team of community health workers that have been oriented on the immunization program. They know the schedule, they know when a child is supposed to get what, how many doses, and, 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 and these people have helped a lot moving from house to house. It is difficult to manage them during their routine immunization program, but at least this is one of the benefits of the supplemental immunization activities because during that time there are adequate resources and, and the VHTs are sensitized more and, and at least we ride on that. Whenever there is a campaign, the VHTs are given more information and, and they continue on until they, yeah, routine. Of course, the money is not there to sustain they are working on, but at least is one of the channels that is used to mobilize the communities. Engagement of non-health stakeholders, especially through the churches, the kingdoms, you know, using every opportunity that there is to, to make sure that the communities are, are mobilized. One thing that is coming up is now child registration. And, and this is something that needs to be done very well so that we are able to account for every child so that when somebody is reporting, you know there's a child here by name, the, the father, the mother, and, and we can follow up 
especially for the fraud tracing, and be able to account for every child. So I think that's why the gestation is coming on. Currently, we are using paper registration, but I think it's time an electronic registration system will be established. And if once this is done, then at least we'll be able to account for every child. So that even those who refuse, we can also still say that so-and-so has refused immunization, they reside in this place, and maybe if there's any effort to be done, one can go and look for those particular children that are refusing. So mobilization of the communities, community awareness is key for a very good immunization program. Uh, the, the, the planning, this slide mainly shows the planning that we need to know where the, the, the children who are not reached where they are so that we are able to plan for them. This example is an equity assessment that was done in 2016 to identify the areas that have large numbers of unimmunized children and get the reasons why these children are actually not, not reached. So the map shows 36 districts and, and these districts, if you remember the map that was shown earlier, the, the children who are not immunized, most of them are in the urban centers, in the districts hosting refugees. So, so and, and, and the, the, uh, the reasons were actually found are the urban poor settlements, the migrant tribes, the ethnic minorities, there are some religious groups in some, especially in the eastern part of Uganda, there are religious sects that refuse the immunization, the new settlements, the fishing communities. We have a lot of lakes in Uganda, so the fishing communities, because they are mobile, we find that some special effort has to be made to make sure that we reach the fishing communities. The refugee communities, also a lot of effort needs to be done and, and make sure that, that they are also reached. And the remote communities, there are some areas like there are two or three districts that are made up of islands. So going out to reach to those children, you have to make an extra effort to make sure that you reach, if you are to reach, to reach and every child. So we need to identify where they are and then plan to reach them and make sure that they, they are reached and to sustain that program, it needs a little resources as I will show you later. This is just the same map showing the unreached populations. And, and when you see, you look at these three maps, you see that the, the urban areas, the areas with large numbers, the population are the areas that are actually have large numbers of unimmunized children. That's why there's need for a special program to reach the urban unimmunized and, and actually plan, plan for them properly. Uh, here we gave an example of Kampala, Kampala State Council Authority. It is the capital city of Uganda and we have had some extra effort that have been put in to make sure that we, we know we reduce the numbers of unimmunized children and, and a lot of progress is done. One key thing about city authorities, you find that in Kampala, for example, only 16 health facilities are public and 172 are private. So dealing with the private facilities to make sure that they support the, the, the population is something that needs to be addressed when you are looking at urban, urban populations. The VHT registration, you know the VHTs in state, in cities are not the same as the VHTs in communities. So there's a special effort and, and special energy that has to be put in to make sure that these VHTs actually do the work that they are supposed to do. And, and if you consider electronic registration, I think we shall start off with the urban, urban populations. And, and also knowing that the urban populations are mobile, they, are, they move in and out, so it is very difficult to follow them. That's why you find that even in urban areas, the high dropout rates because when somebody starts DPT1, maybe they move out to another area. So there's a very high dropout rate, which can be explained. So if you had a, a registered children, I think this would be able to be able to follow up the children where they, they move to. Uh, another key thing about immunization that we need, that is necessary, is, is uh, monitoring and evaluation and, and surveillance to make sure that we know how we are moving, to make sure that every child is reached, to, to make sure that the health facilities that are doing the immunization, that they actually tally and report regularly. So there has to be a system. In Uganda, we have the HMIS that is established well enough, at least to be able to pick out the, the data. And regularly there are EPI reviews and, and surveys that, that are done. 
and to, to make sure that we know where we are and, and, and it helps in, in the planning. So monitoring and evaluation is key in the uh, monitoring the immunization program. Of course, surveillance, looking for the diseases to be able to tell whether we are doing well or we are not doing well. In Kampala, for example, the, the measles outbreaks already start in Kampala City Council. Though we, we have a very good coverage, usually more than 90% coverage rates, but the, 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 the outbreaks usually start in the cities. And this is because of the very high population. Even if you reach 90%, there's always a very big population that build up. And in the end, we end up with uh, uh, an outbreak. So surveillance is also key to, to monitor and make sure that the immunization program is actually working. Just on the right here, we have the maps that, that show quarterly the, the analysis of the data that is available to make sure that we know where, which areas are performing well and those which are not doing well, and then plan accordingly. So monitoring is, is very important in a good immunization system. Uh, this slide is also some contributing things, factors to the, a very good immunization system. Uh, I will start with the supplemental immunization activities. This started in the late, in, in the mid 90s. And, and, and we have seen that the, the programs, the immunization campaigns starting with polio, then we had the, the MNTE campaigns, then the measles campaigns, and then so many other campaigns. But, but they contribute greatly to, to the, at least they've contributed greatly to the immunization, immunization program, because usually there are lots of fund, funding that is available during the campaigns. It, it helps to micro plan and, and mapping of the service delivery, getting people who are not usually reached during their routine immunization. And, and during this time when the during the campaigns, if we identify such communities, it is much easier to follow them up after the campaign. So the, the, the supplementary immunization activities have contributed to this, identifying the unreached population, the unimmunized target population, the zero dose that we talk about in the, in the polio campaigns and measles. It helps to know how they it, it somehow reaching out to these populations, and, and the campaigns have also contributed a lot to the building up the, the improving the, the capacity storage capacity because there are lots of funds that are available. Fridges have been bought, vaccine carriers, and all other tools, and and the campaigns also provide an opportunity to train large numbers of health workers to make sure that they, they are on board. So it helps during those, we take usually that opportunity to add in so many other things on teen immunization when we are doing a, a campaign. Advocacy and awareness, of course, if we looked at uh, data coverage at, around, uh, around the time of the campaign, so immediately after there is a, a bigger, a higher immunization coverage because of this heightened advocacy and awareness for, on, on immunization. So campaigns contribute a lot have contributed a lot to the immunization program. And one other main thing, and which is the most important for this, everything cannot be done unless we have the, the resources that we require. So immunization partnerships and, and resource mobilization and the people who contribute resources, I think is also very key. When, for example, Gavi started, if you look at the, 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 the when we started getting Gavi funding in 2002, the coverage was very low, but with time, it kept on increasing and increasing until we reached that level. And, and when the funds are out, you know, the coverage drops again. When they come in, then we rise up again. So funding is very key. And, and we have had so many different people contributing to this. And, and of course, the other partners working with them to make sure we do the planning, we support the Minister of Health for them to be able to get where they are supposed to be is, is key. So partnership is a key thing for on an immunization, immunization program. Uh, just, this is one of my last slides, is just look at the immunization and the COVID-19. And of course, because of the lockdown, because of the fear, because of the, you know, so many factors, the, the, the immunization program has slowed down. And, and as an example, I think an analysis was done January to April there is that decline, especially between March and April, more than 17% coverage compared to 2019, 2019 data, DPT coverage. 
and, and this has had uh, an impact on all the Afghans. It is a big fear that if we don't do anything in, in this interim period, uh, eventually we end up with measles and, and polio outbreaks especially. So, so a lot of effort is being put in actually to make sure that the immunization program is, is back, at least on track. Communities are being mobilized. And, and, and I, we think that the, once we get some moderate PPEs for the health workers and the communities with some good mobilization, the immunization program is going to, to start. So a lot of effort is being put there to do to have the PPEs, both for the health workers and the communities. And then the community mobilization to tell them that there is that need for this continued immunization program. Otherwise, we end up with with outbreaks if nothing is done immediately. Uh, this is just a summary slide in conclusion that it is important for a very successful immunization program. We have to have the vaccine supply quality to be able to have the, the potent vaccines delivered to the right eligible population at the right time and, and in the right doses and everything. Of course, logistics, I've talked about the logistics, the distribution need, and, and the last mile delivery still has a problem, but it is something that we need to do accessibility to, include, to include, include, improve on accessibility. Service delivery is also another big area which has health workers and, and, and in so many other things, including micro planning to reach and to make sure that every child is actually identified, planned for, and, and reached, and if not reached, find out why, and, and see how we can address those issues that are hindering that child to be immunized. Monitoring and surveillance is key, and of course, advocacy and communication to create demand for an immunization program. And then the supporting areas, the sustainable financing management, strengthened human and institutional resources are all key to an immunization program. I'll just end here with some few pictures showing in the, this is the most recent one of these, all these photographs. The most recent one uh, in one of the remote districts in, in Uganda, where we have the, the hand washing as you come in, the, the, the social distancing you can see. And I think this time, this photo, when it was taken, the masks had not come on board so much. So, but if we get pictures now, we shall see a lot of masks. I think this is one of the other one where the, the, the health worker is putting on a mask. This is more in, in town than this one. And, and these are older, older pictures. I'll end with this slide, just showing how difficult the health workers, the difficulties they go through in reaching out. These are two teams, one team, uh, going for an outreach, just going into a small, small path, going out for an outreach somewhere in, in the communities. And then here, uh, health workers, you know, crossing waters, just walking in to go to make sure that they take services near to their communities. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Eva Kabogara. What a wonderful insight into uh, Uganda and uh, and how things are uh, going there. So, um, in our, uh, we can now move uh, to the uh, to the Pacific, and it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Razul Bagarov. Uh, uh, Razul holds a medical and health management economics degree from universities in Baku, in London, Nottingham, and Aberdeen. He attended Harvard School of Public Health as a Takemi Fellow in 2002 and 2003. He was originally trained as a cardiac surgeon in his home country, where he was involved in clinical work at Institute of Experimental Surgery in Azerbaijan. W, the World Health Organization representative to Samoa, American Samoa, Cook Island, Nui and Tukola in January 2017. Prior to that appointment, he'd served more than 12 years for the World Health Organization at regional, sub-regional and country levels, including serving as coordinator of integrated service delivery at uh, WHO Regional Office for Western Pacific, team leader for health systems strengthening at the WHO office in Cambodia, health systems advisor at PAHO and AMRO sub-regional programs in the Caribbean, and as a technical officer at the World Health Organization Regional Office for Europe. Um, prior to that, 
Dr. Uh, Razul Bagarov worked for the World Bank Group as a human development officer in Europe and Central Asia. Dr. Bagarov. Um, thank you very much, Professor Moore. Um, and uh, as you said, from uh, Uganda, we're moving to Pacifica, to Samoa. Uh, for this particular talk, I've chosen the topic of the outbreak to describe what happened in Samoa, and most importantly, to learn some lessons from this, which I believe extend far beyond um, Samoa and could be applied perhaps elsewhere. <clears throat> I will, um, this is a content of my presentation. Uh, we'll start with a short video clip just to introduce to the country as well to see what it looked like during the outbreak, uh, as including the response. Uh, of course, uh, some words about Samoa, uh, but uh, specifically uh, focusing on the uh, immunization rates before the outbreak. Uh, then, of course, I need to present the outbreak itself uh, with the response, and then we will end up with the lessons. So I would like to uh, play a video now, and uh, can we please have it? Thank you very much. I'll, I'll get back to my slides. Um, so yeah, this clip was just um, to show uh, kind of in a picture, special way, uh, what has happened and how important vaccination is. But let me uh, give a few more words about the outbreak in Samoa and of course about the country, uh, particularly for those who come not living in Pacifica in this region. Uh, Samoa is a, is a small uh, island country. Um, uh, consisting of two main islands, uh, Savai and Opolo. Uh, you see the population is relatively small. Uh, it's big actually for the island countries, but it's, it's small, it's uh, under 200,000. But importantly, uh, many Samoans living also in New Zealand, the United States and Australia, uh, as well as American Samoa. Um, country got independence in 1962, 
it's upper in, uh, upper middle income country uh, with majority population living in the rural areas. I can talk more about, of course, how beautiful Samoa is, but uh, let us focus on the immunization rates and the uh, pre before the before the outbreak. Uh, this simple slide just shows uh, the um, uh, what uh, last 18 years uh, the rates, uh, particularly for measles containing vaccines one and two. One in yellow, uh, blue is uh, um, is uh, uh, second dose of vaccine, and just for comparison, DTP. At, on, on the top, you will see that uh, rates were not really constant uh, all these years. They were ups and downs, particularly there was some big improvement between 2010 and 2014, and then uh, the rate was sliding down for uh, uh, measles vaccines. But uh, you will see that in 2018, there was uh, quite a drop uh, in the immunization rate. And that was for a particular reason, because in the middle of that year, we somehow experienced uh, two uh, adverse events following immunization. It happened due to the uh, MMR vaccination on two babies, um, 12 months old, in the, in the same rural uh, district facility uh, where they used uh, from the same vial, uh, they were vaccinated and they died uh, roughly within one hour from each other. Um, of course, this is a huge event uh, for the country. Immediately the vaccine was suspended and investigation started. Um, this is the timeline of the events. Uh, so M MMR was suspended across the country uh, from the very next day and investigation started, which continued in fact for, for, for quite some time. Uh, for nine months, uh, MMR was suspended as investigation was still looking at the clues. Of course, the first thing to suspect is vaccine itself, whether it's, um, you know, the quality, whether it's not expired, whether it was properly stored or not, and so on. But the, the investigation arrived in conclusion that it was due to the human error, what we call administrative um, uh, mistake or error. Uh, due to the, uh, uh, it was two nurses who was implicated uh, mixing um, a wrong uh, vial with uh, diluent. Um, they were sentenced later in, 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 in the middle of uh, 2019, uh, but uh, it was very important that even when MMR started in, in April 2019. Uh, the uptake levels was very low because of people were still uh, not trusting the system. In the meantime, <clears throat> New Zealand, which is a neighborhood of, of Samoa, experienced their own outbreak, uh, which started early that year, continued throughout 2019. And uh, traffic between New Zealand and Samoa is very intense because of, as I mentioned earlier, there are communities of Samoa uh, living in New Zealand. So it just took some time for someone to come and introduce the measles uh, on the islands uh, of Samoa, um, with numbers growing steadily for in September, uh, the government uh, pronounced an outbreak on 16th of October. The still situation was not, was still getting worse day by day. Uh, and in one month, uh, despite the, some measures, including uh, supplementary vaccination, was getting worse. So in the mid of, of 2015, uh, sorry, mid 2019, uh, mid of November, the government moved to the state of emergency, trying to vaccinate every single person who is older than six months old and younger than 60 years old. And uh, that measure was actually effective by the end of the 2019, the, uh, the epidemic subsided and state of emergency was lifted. So this is uh, um, uh, the epic curve for the, for the epidemic, uh, both by onset date and notification date. You will see this is a, this is a relatively classy uh, curve in the sense that it was just going up and reaching the highest numbers toward the end of November and then subsiding uh, shortly after toward the end of the year. Uh, this is basically a summary table which uh, brings all the numbers together as to with a toll uh, of, uh, of this tragedy in Samoa. Uh, you will see that um, altogether uh, uh, more than 5,000 people were, were infected with unfortunately we lost 83 lives in Samoa. More signif significantly also that most of these deaths came to the group of children under five years old. Uh, remember that MMR was suspended for nine months uh, and also before the, before the outbreak there was already 
uh, numbers were sliding down. So that groups were, that particular group was particularly susceptible to disease. And um, this is not surprising that if you look at the attack rate and case fatality rates, they are much high in this uh, uh, age group category. So Samoa, as I mentioned, is a small country with uh, limited uh, resources um, to respond. So at some point, the government called uh, WHO to help with, to bring uh, what we call EMTs, emergency medical teams. And they, come, they came from around the world. Of course, they, the countries like New Zealand in the first place and or Australia provided the, the major support to, to Samoa. But, but teams also came from as far as Norway and, and Israel. Uh, as well, we have uh, even the Pacific Island countries like Kiribati, French Polynesia and Papua New, Guinea, Papua New Guinea also came to the rescue. We had more than 500 uh, foreign employees uh, over two months time in Samoa and most of them are nurses. They play a huge role, tremendous role in, in the lifting out Samoa out of this uh, uh, problem. And uh, the range of activities were happening, of course, measles case management was the most important one, but vaccination came shortly after with mental health support as well. You will see that uh, on the, at the bottom of this slide, you will see that 95% of eligible population was vaccinated within a very short period of time. Uh, this is a supplementary uh, MR vaccine. Uh, and as I mentioned, and this is basically a summary of that slide, that almost everyone got a shot. 98% uh, of eligible population was vaccinated at the time, and this is by category and groups there. So government decided to move boldly to, to prevent uh, this event from happening uh, in Samoa. And in December 2019, there was a parliament session uh, where within one day, they quickly amended the act, uh, infant, amend, infant act by introducing what we call mandatory vaccination by legitimizing um, uh, immunization uh, as prerequisite for the enrollment into school with quite heavy fines for those who are trying to avoid this legislation. Um, again, I'm not going into details of uh, pluses and minuses of mandatory vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, voluntary vaccination, but nevertheless, that was also uh, widely supported within society. And as a result, we know that uh, the rates of immunization, particularly this year, the first quarter of, of this year, is, uh, shows how that immunization rates are really back to what they're supposed to be. So again, as I said, that uh, I particularly would like to focus on the lessons from this because they extend uh, far beyond Samoa. So first of all, you know, allowing to, uh, the immunization rate to slide, even this is, uh, to some extent, it's already creating a problem because it's creating some groups of sus uh, susceptible population. Then, of course, this unfortunate event uh, in 2018 where MMR was suspended for nine months due to investigation, due to these adverse events, created another challenge that for some time, uh, uh, basically more than one of cohort of children was missing vaccination altogether. Plus, of course, when it was restarted uh, after nine months, again, the uptake was low as, uh, as the mothers and, and parents were not really trusting the system. Um, then uh, I also mentioned that when you have uh, outbreaks in neighborhoods, somewhere in neighborhoods, you need to be particularly vigilant. You need to be particularly be very uh, careful with surveillance. Uh, and uh, because the introduction of, of infection uh, could happen any time at a time. And uh, is, as I said, that it was uh, most likely was due to the traveler from New Zealand. And last but not least is the anti-vaccination campaigners. I've also was become quite active in Samoa around that time where the adverse event happened. They just felt like that this is a good time to really make noise. So they came in boldly, both online and in country, start, started, you know, again, creating additional uh, stress on the system and pushing the parents to withdraw their children from being vaccinated. So this is a very important additional source. But, and this is probably the most important lesson that, that I would like to bring, is that vaccines work. Because what we have clearly seen in Samoa is that, you know, once you have you immunized the whole population, you, you see clearly and quickly subsiding whole, whole epidemic. And you also could see from early days 
that most people who was really suffering most, affected most, are actually those who've been not vaccinated in the first place. So this is a very clear lesson. I think some more have learned this lesson. It's unnecessary, it was preventable, but it was it's what happened. And I think that what we see now, uh, this year, is uh, routine immunization back on track, MMR back on track. And so that's, uh, that's uh, left, left, of course, a lot of uh, bad feelings, but, but also a teach taught lesson to, to the people. And, and I think this lesson is really important, not only for Samoa, but far beyond Samoa. So thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Dr. Razul Bagarov, thank you so much. These are really important lessons as to just how things can get out of hand, but also uh, how uh, groups from across the world can also assist when things do go awry. And uh, I think that's uh, really been very helpful as we go uh, around, the, uh, around the world looking at, uh, at different uh, situations. So uh, it's now my, uh, just before I introduce um, Professor D'Souza, uh, let me just remind people that if you do have a question to ask and you're on the uh, a webinar, then use Q&A. I see there's already one important question there which we'll uh, answer in uh, uh, after uh, Dr. Uh, Professor Ricciardi. Uh, but let me introduce uh, Louis Eugenio D'Souza. Uh, who is a professor at the Federal University of Bahia in uh, uh, Brazil, where he coordinates health economics, technology, and innovation program of the Institute of Collective Health. The former head of the Brazilian Public Health Association at Brasco, and a member of the Policy Committee of the World Federation of Public Health Associations for many years. More importantly, he is now the president-elect and vice president of the World Federation of Public Health Associations. Uh, at the University in Baha, he coordinated the Graduate Program of Collective Health between 2015 and 2019, with nearly 30 professors and 250 graduate students under his supervision. Prior to that, uh, he was Head of Municipal Health and uh, Secretariat of Salvador de Baha uh, in Brazil, so that was from 2005 to 2007. And later, from 2008 to 2009, he was Director General of the Science and Technology Department of the uh, Ministry of Health. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Luis Eugenio Patella Fernandez de Souza. Who is on mute? Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you. And congratulations for this important uh, meeting discussion. Uh, Actually, I'm talking in behalf of Dr. Carla Dominguez, who, who was former co national coordination of the immunization program for 10 years from 2000 to 2011. And she can't be present today, so I will present her slides. So the challenge for improving vaccine coverage in Brazil. Actually, uh, the national immunization program used to be a proud for all health workers, public health workers in Brazil. We had a very successful history from at least 25 years of increasing coverage, controlling polio, measles, and all preventable diseases by vaccines. Unfortunately, in the last years, we see a drop, a reduction in the coverage, and it has several reasons. But you can see in this slide, we have a drop in polio from the 2011 to 2019. We used to have a hundred percent of coverage. Now it has 82 percent. Same thing to MMR, also a reduction in, in, in coverage. How can we explain this reduction? At least three possibilities of causes. The mistrust of populations in vaccines, the difficult they have to have access to vaccines, and also difficult to related to the information systems. Let's see it one by one. With the control of polio, people are not more used to see the, the, the severity of this disease. 
they only was, became something that was far in the, in, the, in, the, in the time. So they were not aware of the severity of the preventable disease and so of the importance of the relevance of taking a vaccine to have polio prevented. Maybe it's a reason. Also, we have a problem of the relation between risk and benefit of the vaccines. And we are, in, unfortunately, you have a lot of fake news and anti-vax groups promoting fake news, not say about the safety of vaccines and of the effects, the effectivity of vaccines. It's a problem but because they are promoting disease, they are promoting the suffering of people. Instead, when you know that vaccines are very, very powerful and very safe way of protecting the health of people. Of course, there are some adverse events associated with vaccines, but they are minimal and they are controlled. So it's, they do not justify the fake news in any campaign against the use of vaccines. Maybe the problem is not that people do not believe in vaccines, but related to the complexity of the schedule of vaccines. We have, during the time, incorporated several different vaccines. And now the schedule is very complex, as you can see in the slide. We have, since the, the vaccines, BCG vaccines at birth, until vaccines for, for kids at 11 year old kids of human papilloma va vaccines and others. So even the health professionals have difficulty in managing this complex schedule of vaccines. Maybe it has contributed to this drop in the coverage. And we have also problem in the working of our healthcare units of our, our vaccination services. So sometimes we lose the opportunity, even if when people go to the health services, they are not uh, captured, captured for the vaccine services. So we lost the opportunity. And also we, have, we had in the last few years some important, even partial, but important shortage of some products, some vaccines in the country. Most of vaccines are produced in country in, in, for, for labs, for Brazilian public labs, laboratories of vaccines. But we had to change, to, to modernize these labs. They were working for several years and during this period, you had shortage of some products that may have led to this drop in vaccines also. In some areas of the countries, especially in the periphery of the big cities, you have a, big, a huge problem of urban violence. So healthcare workers have difficult to have access to this community because they are controlled by the the criminals, especially drug dealers. And sometimes we need even to mobilize the arm to get some emergent actions in these areas, as you can see in the picture. And we are a large country with some remote areas that are not easily accessible for the health facilities, for the health services. You, you can see a line, a lot, a lot, a lot of people waiting for vaccines for a yellow fever during an outbreak in a rural area of the country. We need also to, to improve or to expand the hours of functioning of the vaccination services. Usually they, they function, they work, they work only in the commercial period from seven in the morning until five in the afternoon. And people who have to work, they have difficult to go to the services during this period. So we're trying to expand until 
the evening, the hours fun of functioning of the services. Maybe this, this is another reason of the not expanding, is another reason of the reduction in the, in the coverage. And finally, you have a problem in our health systems information, information systems. We used to have a manual written system that worked pretty well, but you make, were making a transition to online and digital record systems. And not everywhere in the country we have good logistic conditions, infrastructure conditions to have a good system, digital system working. So in this transition from the written to the digital system, we have maybe lose some data and not being registered vaccine coverage. In conclusion, lessons learned on an effective way to improve vaccination. That's what we are trying to do now to overcome this drop in coverage. Partnerships with schools and universities, flexible opening hours for vaccination services, adequate communication to the population, above all about the benefits of vaccination, mobilization of civil society and scientific societies, expansion of vaccine stocks, and improvement of information systems. We think that this important initiative of the World Federation of creating this immunization task force group could help to improve strategic communication between health professionals and the population about the benefits and the importance of vaccination. And maybe we could organize a global survey on the population's per perception of vaccines in order to understand the motivation for non-vaccination, to look for regional, national, local, and global strategies to resume high vaccination coverage. Motivations can be related to ideological, religious, or cultural issues, and you be, we must be aware of this. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, uh, Professor uh, D'Souza, and a particular thank you also to Dr. Carla Dominguez for uh, her preparation, and uh, unfortunately she could not uh, be uh, with us uh, at, uh, at this stage. Uh, it's now uh, having been to Uganda, to the South Pacific, uh, to South America, uh, we're now going to uh, move to Europe. And it's my pleasure uh, to introduce Professor Volta Ricciardi, who is the president of the World Federation of Public Health Associations. Uh, he was a professor of hygiene, he is a professor of hygiene and public health at the Catholic University of the Sacred Heart in Rome, in Italy. Uh, this week, he uh, commits his term as president of the World Federation, and I certainly look forward to continue working with Volta in this capacity. Uh, he is a director of the World Health Organization Collaborating Center of Health Policy, Governance and Leadership at the Institute of Public Health and the Medical School at the Catholic University of the Sacred Heart. He's president, he was president of the European Public Health Association, UFA, in 2010 and 2011 and uh, in 2014. Uh, in 2017, he was honored by being appointed a commentatore of the Italian Republic by decree of the President of the Republic. And in November 2017, he was appointed a member of the Executive Board of the World Health Organization. He's very widely published with over 300 papers in scientific uh, journals. And it's now my great pleasure to introduce my colleague, my friend, uh, Professor Volta Ricciardi. Thank you very much, Michael. It's a pleasure for me to be here today and to talk about this is very important issue from a European perspective. Uh, in Europe, we have uh, uh, quite different problems in the sense that uh, we don't have financial or organizational problems. Uh, and, but we have a commitment in general that every European government belonging to the European Union should improve the health of the population through vaccination to reduce the burden of infectious disease that can be prevented by a vaccine harmonize vaccine strategies, ensure equity and access to high quality vaccines and high level immunization services by reducing inequalities, 
to contrast inequalities by promoting vaccine interventions in marginalized or particularly vulnerable populations, and to ensure an active <coughs> and free offer of vaccination in the age groups and population risk, and particularly focus on for the elderly with the introduction of free of charge vaccination. And this has to be done at national level because even though there is the possibility for uh, European citizens uh, to move around uh, the 27 member states to seek for care, vaccination has to be delivered at national level. So this is the use of appropriate financial resources, uh, of of human resources, of logical resources. For instance, in Romania in 2015, there was a major outbreak of measles because of problem of procurement. Of, but most of all, it needs political willingness. And this in times is very seriously harmed by the incredible active uh, uh, propaganda that anti-vaccination is doing in Europe. This is a very uh, old struggle that started with the start of vaccines. So when Edward Jenner uh, discovered the vaccines uh, uh, in, uh, in the uh, late uh, 18th century, the reaction by the anti-vaxxers was already very evident is in this picture where they showed that people transformed into cows by the vaccines. And you can imagine a dying of the disease uh, uh, of where uh, Edward Jenner found uh, a, a vaccination. So you can understand that uh, uh, skepticism and resistance and, and what I, I would call today hesitancy is very old, but this can be very risky. And in fact, in many European states, and this is the case of Italy, has uh, led to a major dropping in vaccination. Traditionally, in the past, herd immunity was easily reached for all uh, preventable uh, uh, diseases, uh, but uh, starting from 2014, when I took office as president of the Italian National Institute of Health, all uh, vaccines uh, uh, dropped below the, the safety line, and this was certainly an alarm. And in fact, the, the diseases were started to grow again. This is the uh, but uh, I can tell you later that measles was the most uh, important uh, outbreaks that we had in those years. Why is that? Because uh, vaccine hesitant individuals are, are a very heterogeneous people who hold varying uh, degrees of indecision about specific vaccines or vaccination in general, as Wiesel Genio and Razur already underlined. And vaccine hesitant individuals remain concerned about vaccines. Some may refuse or delay some of them, but accept others. Uh, some individuals may refuse all vaccines. Some of them can become really activists in fighting against. Why is that? There are different determinants. Uh, some are related to countries. Some are related to specific uh, characteristics of individuals or groups. Uh, some certain, certainly are related to vaccine or vaccination specific issues. And why is that? Because as uh, is very clearly explained in this book, which I strongly advise to read by Philip Roth, describing an outbreak of polio in the, in the United States uh, in the 50s, uh, when there was no vaccines and essentially the scare, the people just reacted with terror to an outbreak of polio. And of course, uh, they fear the consequences of having uh, problems like the one that have been uh, describing in the pictures. So we had that when we released the vaccine, long queue of people asking for a vaccine. And we had an incredible advocate in Elvis Presley that in one night uh, promoted on a TV show the provision of vaccines against polio. And the following day, the coverage was absolutely total. So in, in only one night, 100% uh, of the population participated in the request of the polio. That was mainly due to fear. That was mainly due to terror. Now it's not uh, the way that it was because in other words, vaccines are victims of their own success. So people are more scared of the side effects of vaccine rather than of disease that they have prevented. And this is incredibly fueled by the anti-vaccination claims that you can find in the, in the social media, where you can find that vaccine causes essentially everything, that they are simply the evil, that uh, of course they can produce a lot of problems, particularly to children. And they use incredibly strong visual communication such as these, that of course scares 
mothers and parents, while sometimes the reactions by the institution is very mild, is very scientific oriented, is very difficult to understand from these scared parents. And of course, there is the, the propaganda about the fact that the people that promote vaccines are corrupt because they support big pharma. You know that this is not true. When you make any kind of cost effectiveness analysis, you find that the cost of the MMR, for instance, vaccination, is incredibly lower. It's not possible to compare the cost of an epidemic, of an outbreak, uh, to the cost of vaccination, which is one of the most effective, cost effective uh, treatment. But this is difficult to explain that, uh, of course, uh, uh, drug companies, which are not charity companies, of course, make a profit on vaccines. But this is not certainly the most important profit they make. And of course, uh, what you remember Elvis Presley uh, advocating for polio. We have indeed uh, celebrities that advocate against vaccines. You may recognize some of them, Hollywood stars such as Jim Carrey or Jenny McCarthy, and even the president of the United States campaigning for his election say that, you know, he wouldn't uh, push for proper vaccination uh, and uh, allowing one-time massive shots that a small child cannot take uh, making the parents again this fake news about autism and the relationship with the MMR. But what's the problem with us? What's the problem with science? What's the problem with public health professionals? Is that the tools that we use to counteract the anti-vaccine movement, of course, includes our, our traditional tools, statistics, research, evidence-based information, and often we deliver them with complex charts, histograms, or statements uh, that are released in a very rigorous but very difficult to understand from lay people. And this approach uh, actually is not effective enough on its own to convince vaccine-hesitant parents that vaccines are safe, effective, and crucial to their children's health. And why is that? And why do we have to change? And we have to embrace a new way of communication with parents and in general, because vaccines are not now only dedicated to children, but also to elderly people and to other stories. Stories are the default mode of human thoughts. Uh, they are not numbers, not charts, not histograms. And storytelling is the most powerful tool. So utilizing some of the storytelling strategies using by the anti-vaccine movement, in addition to evidence-based information, could potentially offer providers, public health officials, and pro-vaccine parents an opportunities to mount a much stronger defense against anti-vaccine messaging. Actually, it worked. But of course, it works if we rethink vaccine policy making in this area of vaccine hesitancy. So in other words, we have to give people information in a right place we have to target appropriately who do we want to educate. So schools, universities are very good places where we can have these activities. We have to rethink our vaccine policies that the national, state and local immunization programs uh, uh, that implement can be less reactive. As Luis Eugenio said, not waiting for people in our office, but going there where people live and work. And of course, being proactive means new ways to identify mechanisms and opportunities to shape social norms regarding immunization attitudes and behaviors. And get back to the basis. To understand that parents who refuse vaccines overwhelmingly do so because they firmly believe they are doing what is best for their children. So we need policies and practices that are grounded in this perspective rather than focus on blaming parents and forcing parents to comply. Of course, it's not time to abandon current policies, but rather it's time to consider how we might redesign and rebuild vaccine policy and the policy making process to regain public confidence and sustain it in the future. Of course, this cannot be enough. Actually, in Italy, we started that, but when we had these massive outbreaks uh, together with Romania of uh, measles, uh, more than 5,000 cases uh, with a median age of 27 years old and the hospitalization rate of about 40%, we took actions. And of course, it was difficult, but we were able to pass a law in Parliament introducing mandatory vaccination for uh, children for 12 uh, vaccinations. 
This was followed in the following years by France and from some point of view uh, from Germany and even the Netherlands and the United Kingdom that traditionally have used a much more voluntary based approach are following this pathway. Sometimes you don't have to time to convince parents and you, you have time to, of course, pass a law, even if this is difficult, if it, this can provoke reaction by the hesitant people that at that time when we introduced the, the law was 30% of the population. They even went into the road to, to protest against the law. But I can tell you that after only one year, we not, not only we caught up in the coverage of bringing back the percentage of coverage to the herd immunity uh, threshold. But we reduced the vaccine hesitant population to no more than 3% because essentially we activated other ways of information of involving people. How do we do? Three examples. Uh, when a, a, a little girl died in Bologna because of pertussis, uh, the mother, rather than uh, only crying and despairing for the loss of of her was recruited as one of the most important campaigner and advocate for vaccination. And she, she launched a, a petition on change.org that reached the support of tens of thousands of young mothers, only in one, 24 hours, 30,000 young mothers, saying that they want to protect their children through vaccination. So this is very important because it's not from the public health authorities. This came from mothers, parents, families. We also have to be grateful to this guy. You don't know him, but this Italian scientist that has been celebrated by science as one that has become a celebrity by fighting vaccine skeptics with a very active campaign on social media and with a very aggressive kind of talk. So rather than trying to explain, he really uh, uh, made an aggressive irony and humor. Uh, this is uh, an example uh, blaming uh, parents, uh, not of course the ones that are scared for the health of their children, but one that are making active propaganda based on ignorance and on aggressive tools that I showed before. And this was extremely successful. Of course, he is a kind of love or hate him, but there are much more people that love him because he has something like one million followers on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on Facebook. Uh, and of course, uh, this changed uh, the narrative of the of the of the story and of course we recruited other kinds of celebrity i can i'm sure you recognize the guy on the left you may not know the paralympics gold medalist on the right and she is a lady that was severely harmed by the fact that a doctor a doctor a pediatrician gave her false and wrong advice to the parents not to vaccinate again uh, meningitis, again meningococcus, and she very bravely showed the scars of their suffering, encouraging uh, parents and uh, young kids uh, to be vaccinated uh, to avoid the suffering that uh, she said. And uh, we even recruited the Pope. Uh, this is the Pope vaccinating a child, and you can imagine that particularly in Catholic countries, this is very reassuring for a family looking to the Pope uh, giving something which some people think is the evil, uh, is not the evil, is protecting children. So in conclusion, overall, the design and delivery of intervention should try to reflect the following points. Target audiences should be clearly identified and specific issues were researched and understood. Intervention should focus on meaningful engagement, i.e. dialogue based, social mobilization that supports realistic action Contestual influence from the individual to, to the health systems should be acknowledged and accounted for when choosing strategies. Intervention should be multi-component and seek to address primary determinants of uptake across the different domains of influence and interventions must be evaluated, even when there is this striking success as we had in some European countries. Evaluation is a very important tool to improve, improve, improve. Thank you very much for that. Uh, thank you uh, so much, uh, Professor Voto Ricciardi. And uh, before I go to uh, before I go to questions, I would uh, just like to uh, thank our sponsors uh, that have made this session possible and uh, uh, supporters. And that's Pfizer, 
It's the uh, International Immunisation Policy Task Force and, of course, the University of Geneva. I also have to say a big thank you to the staff at the World Federation of Public Health Association who work extraordinarily hard to ensure that we can reach many people. Um, it is now uh, time for uh, questions and I uh, just go to uh, the first question that I have that uh, will go to uh, Dr. Eva. Is Eva with me? Eva, is uh, she with us at the, uh, at the moment? Eva Cabonguera? Uh, perhaps uh, I don't see her on the screen, so uh, I'll uh, ask a similar question that I think uh, um, for uh, Razel Bagarov uh, and for uh, Louis Eugenio de Souza, and that is the issue of cold chain. I was watching those pictures uh, from uh, uh, Dr. Eva where she, where we could see people carrying the vaccines in clearly refrigerated style uh, boxes. Um, however. Of course, uh, vaccines are vulnerable to this, and I wonder how much uh, effort is put in. In uh, let's start uh, with uh, uh, the Pacific with Samoa. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Mura. Uh, yes, I think this is very, very important question because, uh, as I mentioned earlier, that when this adverse event happened in Samoa in 2018, uh, some uh, the initial reaction was probably something wrong with the vaccine itself. Maybe the way it was stored, maybe it was not under the condition, you know, not uh, uh, in the condition that it's supposed to be. And they, something had, something particularly went wrong. So it is absolutely important to make sure that the storage, and of course UNICEF is um, our sister agency, which helped help, help, with the, uh, with, uh, help, help the governments to maintain the cold chain. Um, but but it's important to make sure that the, the vaccines are really stored in a, uh, under a proper temperature. There is a special mechanism to know where the, the temperature maintained uh, uh, this indicator, you know, on the vaccines. Uh, so when, the, when, when before a vaccine is used, it's important to make sure. So in Samoa, um, uh, with an investigation which, was, which happened, particularly in this particular case, it was clearly showing that uh, storage was not um, uh, faulty. Uh, storage was uh, absolutely done properly. And then we also made um, checks with all other district facilities where vaccines are stored. Um, it also was in appropriate temperatures. Indeed, if you, if you move it to the field, uh, you need to absolutely have it uh, in short quantities. Uh, uh, to, the, to the amount of vaccines being performed, whether you have to reach out to the remote areas. But again, in Samoa, this being done very well. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Eva, I wonder if you can uh, respond to that notion about cold chain and uh, reaching those uh, remote communities. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, as I explained, the cold chain is one of the most important things to make sure that the vaccines reaching the child is potent. So the cold chain, as I said, we have a, a, a central vaccine store at the national level. Then from the central vaccine store to the district vaccine store, we have refrigerated trucks that go take the vaccines monthly to the districts. Then from the district vaccine store, we have the health facilities, which have also smaller fridges that keep the, the, the vaccines. And from the health facilities to the communities, we have the vaccine vaccine carriers. Vaccine carrier is a, is a small box that is, has ice packs in and, and we pack in vaccines to make sure that the vaccines are kept, are kept properly. And one of the key things to ensure the vaccine storage is, 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 is on where is the temperature monitoring. And temperature monitoring as, as I showed in the, in the effective vaccine management assessment, temperature monitoring is one of the key indicators that has to be looked at. Every health facility has to keep the temperature monitoring charts for over three years so that when somebody comes for an assessment, he has to do that. So temperature monitoring is key. And then the conditioned ice packs in the cold, in the vaccine carriers when they are going out to the health facility. And then there's also a sponge so that even when you remove a vial, like those ones which have like 10 doses, you know, you still keep it in a, in a sponge to make sure that the temperature is actually maintained at, at the right Thanks. acceptable levels. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. We even have the same problem in developed countries. I know that uh, sometimes general practitioners' fridges 
are used for things other than vaccines and uh, you know for the sandwiches for lunch and uh, so forth and uh, and they need uh, monitoring and that education uh, needs to uh, to continue uh, i'm going to ask uh, uh, professor de souza about uh, brazil but while you're answering that question we also have another one uh, which is about the sustainable development goal three health and well-being uh, the target for preventing uh, u5 mr by 2020 uh, what are the ch with all the things happening in Brazil at the moment? What are the chances of achieving that uh, goal by uh, by uh, the end of 2020? Yes, thank you. Very important question. Actually, we had a, a target of reducing to zero the deaths for under five children for amenable causes, which would mean reducing to 25 deaths for each a thousand uh, uh, babies born. Uh, in 2015, it was completely feasible, but now considering the economic and social situation is very difficult. If, if, I, if you allow me, Mike, I would share just one slide to show the, the forecasting we are doing. We had published this, colleagues of mine have published, David Rosella and others, published this paper in, in 2018. And you can see what, what's going on with the mortality, under five mortality rates with the economic crisis. And now we are in a longer economic crisis, the, the worst scenario. And you see in the, the green line, it means how even the green line with the maintenance of the conditional cash transfer and the family strategy, health family, family health strategy, you, you see the, the, the slope of the curve is, is slowing after, after 2015. And in the red line, that's the austerity measures that have been taken, reducing the cash, the conditional cash transfer program and also the family health program, you see the, the, the rate of mortality continues to decline, but at a very slow pace. So if you continue in this, in this pace, in this velocity, in this speed of decline, we will not achieve the target for 2030 in the terms of mortality rates, unfortunately. We hope things change quickly in time to be able to accelerate the decline of the mortality rate. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor D'Souza, that's uh, fantastic. Now, um, I would like to address the next question. I'm gonna start with Professor Ricciardi, but uh, the uh, question starts with a statement that the data presents an excellent picture of immunization status in many countries. However, the outbreaks of uh, various diseases indicate something else. So is the data presented not valid or is a problem with vaccine effectiveness, management and administration? Where's the, where's the discrepancy? So I'll start with, uh, with you, Professor Ricciardi, and I'll uh, then go and give others an opportunity to uh, respond as well. No, it has to be checked where uh, you know, the questions come from because uh, in general, when you have high level of coverage, uh, uh, the, the incidence rate of uh, vaccine preventable disease is very low. And uh, whenever you drop uh, below the threshold of herd immunity, this is uh, starting uh, to rise again. So uh, I don't think that there is a contradiction between, uh, of course, it can be that in some specific places you can have problem of provision, problem of storing, uh, uh, but it has to be checked uh, in the very specific uh, place. But in general, there is no correlation like this. Uh, the most uh, is the population cover, the best is the, is the, is the epidemiological uh, situation. Uh, Razul, would you like to uh, respond to that? And also we had a comment earlier that uh, one of the problems leading to uh, the issues in Samoa was that after the uh, um, adverse incidents with those two babies, that some of the staff were also reluctant 
to uh, immunise. So perhaps if you could also just cover that comment. Yes, just to respond to the first one, and I also would like to corroborate what Dr. Professor uh, Ricardo said. Um, you know, just a simple example, uh, at a time when the Samoa experienced outbreak, Tonga as well uh, was affected, uh, but it was affected to much less extent. And the very reason for that was that the, uh, most of the population in Tonga was vaccinated, in fact, close to 99%. Um, and in fa another fact from Tonga was that uh, at the time where Samoa was really struggling, uh, and a number of cases was building up in Tonga as well, but it was mild cases, it was nothing, no one died uh, as a result of, of outbreak. And I guess it was just uh, finding some pockets within this population was still maybe under immunized, but still, again, as I said, it was not to the, to the same extent. So I very much agree if, 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 if the population is fully vaccinated, um, there is uh, very little risk there. Uh, no, responding to the uh, hesitancy on the part of the nurses, I also corroborate that one. Uh, indeed, because I explained that it, it took nine months for the, for the, um, for the um, vaccination ban to be lifted. And that was, lift, that was linked also to the court case because at the time as the suspension was there, uh, was still investigation was ongoing and, and uh, there was hesitancy, hesitancy, hesitancy on the part of the government as well to move on, lift the suspension because of the court case was not completed. And when the court case was completed, there was also not so explicit communication to health professionals as well to, that it's actually, it's very safe to, to continue vaccination. It's not, it's not due to vaccine, it's actually due to the human error. So yes, that's additional factor which, which uh, delayed uh, normalization of, of the routine vaccination and contributed to the outbreak. Thank you. Much of our uh, focus this evening has been around children and vaccination of children, but of course vaccination goes right across the life course uh, and we haven't touched on that uh, very much at all. So um, if any of the others would like to answer the questions that we've uh, just asked, but also uh, respond to the importance of um, uh, vaccination across the life course. And uh, this will uh, be the closing comment uh, for each of you. So I'll go to uh, one of you at a, a time and uh, then we're going to have to draw this webinar to a close. Uh, Dr. Eva Kabongera, thank you so much for your presentation on Uganda and answering questions. Do you have a, a comment around that area? Thank you very much. Uh, vaccination and the life course, it, it is something that when you look at the entire vaccination program, we can, I can start with adolescent. The, the adolescents in Uganda, we, we just introduced the HPV, the human papilloma virus, which we are targeting the 10 year old girls. And at least they get two doses at 10, year, 10 years of age. And also at that time, we also introduced the TD vaccination, the, the vaccination against tetanus. So the, the young girls receive that. And, and if we have a good program, and, and they can get up to at least three doses during their time before they get pregnant, at least the, the protection at birth would improve a lot. So after adolescence, we go to pregnancy. During pregnancy, the TD is one of the key vaccination uh, uh, that has to happen to prevent neonatal, neonatal tetanus. And, and if a child is protected at birth, to make sure that a child is protected at birth against tetanus, so ideally they get two doses, but if you have been giving TD during adolescent, then during pregnancy is checking and making sure that they actually got the doses at the right time. And if there is no proof that they got the vaccines, then we give the pregnant mother at least two doses, one month, one month apart. And, and of course the newborn, newborn we have this polio zero that is given at the, at the, at the birth. And then now we are discussing hepatitis B that is supposed to be introduced at birth. And then after that, we go to the infant. Infant to, to starting at, at six weeks, 10 weeks, 14 weeks for the three doses of the three doses that the doses DPT, then measles at nine months. And then we are thinking of a two in the second year of life when we introduce the second dose of the MR and, and other, 
other things, maybe on the second dose of, of measles, and maybe DPT is also being thought about. So that, that's how the, the whole life course cycle, when I, I would say, yeah, so it is something that is happening. And yeah. And I'm also going to uh, interrupt and just ask you one other question that just come in about uh, the use of registers and coverage, uh, monitoring coverage. Um, and I'll ask the same question about Samoa uh, and Brazil. So uh, there's a, the life course and then uh, and any concluding comment you make, but we do need to uh, wind up. So do you have an electronic register in, uh, in Uganda or what's the, what is the process you're moving towards? At the moment, we don't have a well-established electronic registration, but this is something we are working on. Actually, we, even this morning we were discussing with Kampala State Health Authority to consider starting the registration system. We are starting yeah. by paper registration, but hopefully we shall move into the electronic-based uh, registration, which uh, the, the idea should be using this registration system. We can be able to track each and every child be accountable for each and every child so that at least we can know default address using it to default address and, and reach out to each and every child. So it is that accountability and reaching every child that the electronic registration is Thank actually you very much. Yeah. We look forward to that. Uh, Razo Bakarov. Yes, thank you again for the opportunity. Um, Samo does have uh, the electronic system, but it's not complete. It's just uh, at the central level, but not at the peripheral level. So the work is like in Uganda, it's ongoing to link that two system together to, to create one. Uh, yes, and I just want to say that, you know, I lost my mother uh, due to cancer some time ago and uh, should HPV vaccine be available uh, for her generation, uh, she, may have, she, may, she, should be, she probably would be still alive. So I just want to say again that uh, some more planning to introduce four new vaccines um, and HPV is uh, among them. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, Professor Louis D'Souza. Yes, thank you. Yes, we, we do have a program for life course vaccination. Actually for, for the elderly, the flu vaccinations are, is a huge success, high levels of coverage. And we have a HPV also for, for school children at the 9 to 11 years old. And uh, it, I think that we have not drops in this coverage, we have a good, good situation. And finally, I would like to thank you and congratulate the World Federation for this initiative. And uh, Professor Ricciardi, and uh, you know, when I think of the life course, I also think of influenza, I think of varicella uh, and, uh, and those vaccines for the elderly uh, as, uh, as well. Um, and so, you know, the challenges are there in front of us. And just before I go to you, uh, Professor Ricciardi, we are going to have to let one or two questions go, but there's also been some really nice comments uh, thanking uh, you and each of the panellists. Uh, about uh, the, particularly the information around vaccine hesitancy, but for the whole presentation. Uh, Professor Ricciardi. Yeah, and uh, I think it's very important to consider vaccination as a tool for the entire lifespan. But as uh, we said before, uh, covering and uh, encouraging elderly people to be vaccinated is another story. And uh, there is uh, quite a lot of vaccine hesitancy also in, that, uh, in those uh, age groups. So, so we have to develop specific programs for them. And uh, in particular, uh, I think that anti-pneumococcus and anti-influenza vaccination will be very important uh, in the next autumn and winter when we could have the recurrence of the coronavirus epidemic. So having that protected, uh, of course, it makes a lot of difference, particularly to, to avoid the, inf the, the, the vast uh, uh, people coming to the accident and emergency department. Last but not least, I couldn't agree more with Razul about the HPV. Uh, we have a vaccine which is very important, but we need to promote it mostly. It was not uh, one of the 12 introduced in Italy as mandatory because it's for uh, adolescent girls and we thought that was, has to be a, a free choice. Uh, but the, the, the coverage rate is not yet satisfactory. It's around 60%, so we have to, to work on that. And I think it's the next uh, campaign, you know. Thank you, each and every one of you, for your uh, presentations. 
uh, and uh, for uh, for uh, being uh, being with us. I think that this is uh, has been uh, really very uh, helpful. And a particular thank you to uh, the participants who joined us and have remained through it. And of course, we were also streaming live on Facebook. When we ran a similar uh, presentation uh, earlier in the week, we've had nearly 10,000 people looking uh, at uh, what uh, we were presenting uh, um, through uh, Facebook in particular. So uh, here's, here's a brilliant opportunity to understand what it is that uh, vaccines do. And uh, for my own part, I have to say, uh, I'm a member of Rotary International. I joined Rotary because Rotary was the one that uh, set about to get rid of polio from the world. And you know, with only two countries and about 60 cases uh, this year, what a contrast that is from the pictures that you showed, uh, you showed earlier. So uh, well done all, thank you very much. And thank you all those people for, particip for participating and thank you for our sponsors, Pfizer, for the University of Geneva, to the World Federation of Public Health Association Task Force and our support staff. And uh, at that, I'm now going to uh, close the meeting. Thank you all.